Welcome to You But Better Interviews. 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 We interview the most brilliant thinkers and highest achieving badasses on the face of the planet. I have a dream that one day there is an indefinable, mysterious power. Four score and seven years ago, friends, Romans, countrymen, you are the light of the world. It's not just an interview, it's the interview. You, but better. Hello, better yous. Welcome to another fantastic interviews with a wonderful writer and satirist and just an overall emotional genius, Jason Roeder. Lex, tell us a little bit about our wonderful guests. This is going to be a good one. Today we have a guest who is very smart and savvy emotionally and literarily. I'm sure that's a word. Mm. Uh, Jason Roeder is a humor writer. He is a satirist. He has been a senior editor and senior writer for The Onion, where he's created or contributed to many of The Onion's all-time classic articles and headlines. He's also written for The New Yorker, McSweeney's, and Adult Swim, among others. Jason is the co-author of the college catalog parody, Welcome to Woodmont, and Sex, Our Bodies Are Junk. And, and this is why we're talking to him today, he's the mm. author of the just-released Grief Strike, The Ultimate Guide to Mourning, so which good. was published by McSweeney's at the beginning of this year. That's why we're talking to him today. And as someone who has mastered grief and has mastered helping people deal with and laugh at and laugh with and laugh around grief, we are delighted to speak with him. Jason, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. You wrote Grief Strike during the pandemic after your mother's passing in 2019. First question, at what point internally did you know you had to write this book? I would say as the pandemic started to emerge and people were kind of locking down and I was just kind of sitting with myself and I was like, oh, um, I have to do something um, to... Mm -hmm keep myself busy to keep myself steady and i had this notion that i want to do help people to be of use or something like that and so i'd say around march 2020s when i start to get the the sort of impulse to start writing even though i wasn't sure what exactly it would be but i knew i writing jokes is like w one thing i can do okay and so I guess I'll go with the one thing I know how to do okay. And so that's how that started. That's how I knew I had this thing that would keep me focused and sane um, for at least a few months. That's amazing. Better use, if you want to help people, the first thing you should probably do is sit down and write a book. You heard it here first. Jason wrote a book to help people. And you know what? It is a really fantastic book. And it just... What a selfless thing to do. It, it, is a, it is a very useful book and a very funny book. And, you know, there's a saying from all of the Zen masters, which is use the tools you have. Other Zen masters say, if you're not laughing, you're crying. And you know what? That's what I felt whenever we were approaching Grief Strike, that we were laughing and we were crying. And it was kind of uh, it kind of blew my mind. You can do both together. It's even better. Mm. Okay, Jason, Grief Strike, it approaches grief from all angles. You talk about the passing, the aftermath, the perspective of other loved ones, and so on. So one thing that comes up for me, which is a tricky thing to navigate in grief, is the friendships, the other people. If you're friends with someone who just lost a loved one, what do you recommend? Is it as simple as calling them up and saying, hey, I'm here for you if you need me. Should you try to cheer them up? Should you record a silly TikTok dance that goes viral and then you let your friend know, hey, I just did this dance for you because I know you need some smiles right now. Basically, if you're friends with someone who just lost someone, like what are the top life hacks here? Honestly, I think um, you remember the people who like through all the awkwardness and through, because they don't know what they're supposed to say because I've been on the other side you know, I've, I've been, um, 
around people who've lost people. Yeah. And before my mother died, I didn't know what to do. Like, what what are the wrong words? What are the bad words to say? Yeah. yeah. And what are the right ones? And I didn't know, but now I know that like the gesture, just calling or just texting um, is really sufficient. I mean, and, yeah. you know, you, you remember those people and um, and you remember the people who did not call you. You don't forget those sons of bitches either. Um, wow. But yeah. um, you remember uh, the people who, as confusing as it might have been for them, you know, um, as disorienting and awkward, tried. Yeah. And that's really all you can ask because you don't know what you want to hear and they don't know what you need to hear. So everybody's just kind of groping around. Yeah. Which is fine. It's it's the effort that matters most. Yeah. So don't worry. Don't worry too much about the exact words because we're all just kind of grasping here. We don't know. It's going to be confusing. Yeah. And I, I, I also want to say, you know, when my father passed away, we had a guest book and it was a really good way for me to be able to keep track of who really supported me at that time and who did not show up. And uh, I uh, was immediately able to cut out so many people in my life because they didn't show up to my father's funeral. Yeah, it's, it's really handy. You know, you, you take an inventory of the people in your life and you're like, oh, OK, well, mm. you weren't here. And so you are uh, you're banished. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And we've called out a lot of those people from Seth's past who didn't step up to the plate. We've called them out on this podcast. And, you know, we have a lot of listeners, millions of listeners. So if at any point you feel that you need to call someone out to let them know that they're banished, by all means. Oh, thank you. I mean, I've, I of course, I have uh, let them know personally. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. It's always good to reach out to them to say, hey, you didn't reach out to me. Right, exactly. Yeah, the reach out, anti-reach out. Do you do you have any tips on the best way to to let someone know that they are a banished piece of shit? Should you do it explicitly or should you like should you do it with skywriting where where like should you have an assistant do it? Is it a kind of thing where you want that personal touch where you want to be really aggressive like you're kind of like a a mafia don or something or do you want to do it in a way where they sort of it dawns on them like should you surprise them with it? I I can see a lot of nuance to this issue. Honestly, I just did it um, via group text. Yeah, I just put, you know, uh, 12 or 14 people um, and just the word banished, period. And a couple would write back and they'd say, what? Banished? And I'd say, yes, banished. Yes, and that banished. would be the end of the conversation. Yeah. So all of three or four words. The advantage to that is that you're you're also letting them know that you're not willing to expend a lot of effort on them because they're not worth it. Right, and they're banished. So why would you? Yeah. What, what what is this conversation? You're, you're you're talking to a non person at this point, you know? Totally. Exactly, and you know what? I think it's kind of generous what you did. A lot of times, people think, "Oh, this is a little selfish. You're banishing all these people," but you created a group text. Yeah. So those people, in dealing with the banishment, yes, fuck them. But in dealing with the banishment they're able to have their own little support group. They have other numbers in the group text that they can reach out to to kind of grieve the loss of your friendship. Well, uh, yeah, I gave them a uh, community is what I gave them. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I got not a word of uh, thank you. So now fuck them. That I think is probably common that when you um, this is a thing that I've noticed throughout my self-improvement journey, which is that when you a lot of times when you point out someone's flaws and their lacks, they're not appreciative at first. But trust me, they will be in the long run. That's right. They'll think about it a lot. They always come around eventually. Well, some of them do. Yeah, they always do, mostly. Some of them always come around eventually. Mm. Yep, very true. Definitely. All right, Jason, we are not, as a disclaimer to this next question, we are very against materialism on you but better but that being said we, we actually are... have a t-shirt on sale on our website that says materialism sucks and you could get it right now on the website yeah it's great go to go to ybbpod.com check out that t-shirt if you don't like a t-shirt there are bumper stickers we have mugs um we have one of those squeeze balls that says it yeah st stress ball that says materialism sucks yeah amazing anyway 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 so what we want to say though is that there are 
practical matters related to materialism. And here's what I want to get into. This is a very practical issue. When, when we think of someone close to us dying, it brings this swirl of emotions to mind. An image of major events and places, hospitals, last words, funerals, eulogies, gravestones. But what you, something you point out in Grief Strike is that there are very practical, even tedious, materialistic things that go along with us. Things like watching a PowerPoint presentation at a funeral home to pick out the right material for a casket, or, and this is a tough one, meticulously going through a loved one's belongings and deciding, what do I keep? What do I donate? What do I sell or throw away? Right. And the last thing we want is to give away something we wish we had kept. Say we have uh, our uncle's favorite denim jacket with a super sick deaf leopard patch. Mm. You could make a mistake there. So my question is, in this practical matter, how do you recommend people approach the process of dealing with all those belongings so that doesn't overwhelm them? Uh, well, I'd say I'd say take your time if you can, if you have the luxury of just kind of sifting through it. You know, it's 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 going to be a hard thing to do, and so there may be an impulse to keep everything. Yeah. Mm. You know, like I, I don't because every thing that you put in the goodwill pile, you are sort of sending away. You're sort of in that sort of gesture. You're like giving away a piece of your loved one. Like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're just sitting there and you've got some tie your father wore once 18 years ago. And like, well, it's, it's, it's precious now. Mm, yeah, exactly. So. What I what I would do is um and th th and this is this is not my idea this is sort of kind of like the conventional wisdom but like mm. yeah bring in a um a, a third party maybe a family friend who could be a little dispassionate who can sort of help you sift through it yeah who can help you assess these things as things instead of you know pieces of treasure that can help but the truth is like certain things you're going to categorize as things you don't want to part with. And you'll yeah. hold on to it and then time will pass and you're like, well, you know, do I, do I still need these things? And the answer might be no. Sure. Like maybe you don't need all five of those Ottomans. Maybe you just need two of them. Yeah. Just a couple of them, just like a small stack of them or something, you know? Yeah. But I think, I think you make a great point that it's okay if you keep a lot of that stuff because time might reveal what the important ones are. Mm. Exactly. Because once it's gone. I mean, unless you want to break into a goodwill and, yeah. you know, reclaim that cookie jar or something. Exactly. It's gone. And so hold on to what you can. And then, you know, as time goes on, maybe you can sort of shed some of those bits and pieces. Yeah. That's something you can do. T totally fair. You know, sometimes talking through something, it's, it's, that's the journey to discovery. Yeah. And um, we're glad that we got to witness your discovery today. We love witnessing discoveries. It's literally our favorite thing to do. And we watch the Discovery Channel a lot, actually. That's why, yeah, that's why we watch the Discovery Channel. I do want to mention as a side note that uh, Goodwills, Goodwill stores have surprisingly intense security systems and security guards at night. I just, I don't want to make any assumptions, but I'm just putting that out there. They really do. And I'm, I just want to, I just, not to bring it to me, but to bring it to me, um, when my father passed away, my father was, uh, yeah. uh, he painted cars and uh, he had a very large air compressor and my wife Amaranth was very insistent that I get rid of the air compressor because it was taking up too much of the living room. But I held on to it for a really long time. I gave it to a Goodwill and immediately regretted it. And I found myself trying to break into a Goodwill and, and just, it just didn't work out for me. We, we weren't able to get it back. We did hire a team. Uh, we then hired a second team of ninjas. Yes. It was an unfortunate thing. Uh, we won't give their names away because we signed an NDA with them, but uh, but we do really appreciate the effort they put into it. And we, we want to thank, uh, well, we, we have to grieve the loss of one of the leaders of that group. Can't say his name. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Would you be willing to share something that you kept after your mother passed? Or if not, that's fine. Or something that you weren't sure if you should keep? <sighs> I have a long catalog of her <clears throat> voicemails on my phone. Mm. I have like five years. Oh, wow. And that's, I, I was surprised because people like deleted them mm. from their phones. But I wanted to keep them because they're so 
mundane and everyday. And that's kind of how I wanted to remember her. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, I remember this birthday moment or I remember these words of wisdom. I mean, for me, it was just like, oh, she's calling from her car. Yeah. And she wants to know what I want from Subway, you know, like that yeah. kind of um, in the moment connection is like, it, uh, that's the kind of thing that matters most to me because we weren't, we weren't big on like, you know, holiday gatherings or um, these kind of like constructed family moments. It was just like the little things. And so, yeah. I have all these things I have called she made on my birthday um, mm. where she told me the story of my birth every year. Wow. That's wonderful. It was, it wasn't for her. I was a, cha- I was a challenging newborn, but yeah, those uh, voicemails are, I'm, I'm really glad I still have them and I'm migrating them into a permanent sort of place uh, as we speak. That's, that's really lovely. Wonderful. I mean, it's it's so tough whenever you lose some when you lose somebody you you're there's a fear of of, you know, what if I forget what my 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 loved one sounds like? What if, what if I forget what they were like when they moved? I, I for a long time couldn't find any like videos or pictures of my dad because he re, he didn't like getting pictured. And so I was like, I'm going to forget what he was like. And so it's so beautiful that you were able to save these recordings that you have them. And possibly in the future, you could mint these as NFTs and maybe make a little bit of money off of it. Absolute strong agreement on that. Well, that's the whole idea, to be honest. I'm glad we got to NFTs. Monetizing mothers is kind of something I've always been into. And if you want more, if you want more tips on that, I would recommend checking out our digital program, uh, monetizingmothers.com. I'll just leave that there. Okay. We want to talk about stages of grief. This is something that a lot of people know about, but there's nuance and subtlety to this. Mm, yeah. Uh, you mentioned psychologist Elizabeth Kubler Ross's five stages of grief. People have probably heard of these denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Do you think that, because this can get, it can sound like this academic kind of thing. There is, there are these five stages. They exist. You may or may not go through them. Right. Do you think that knowing these stages and having some awareness of them, is that helpful when you're grieving or does it just, that it doesn't matter or it doesn't help? I, I don't know. I, I, I think, I, I think since those five stages, I think it, like the theory has been revisited with like nine stages or fewer stages. And I think you can experience them in, in a different order. Yeah. And you could always kind of throw your own little wrinkle into it. You know, I, I think it's just kind of like a big, broad template. It could be uh, helpful, but as long as you're not like, oh man, I'm doing this wrong. I'm depressed, but uh, I, I should be, I should be angry. Yeah. The timeline says be angry and I'm, I'm, I'm blowing this. Yeah. I'm, I'm ruining grief on top of everything else. Yeah. Not only are you going through a really hard time, but you're, you're letting down Elizabeth Kubler Ross. You're letting down the academic community, which is a hard thing to have on your shoulders. Or especially at that time, you know, yeah. it's the last thing you want. Yeah. And, you know, she, she's no longer with us, but her estate will find out eventually if you're not doing it right. Certainly. Yeah, that's true. That's true. They'll probably come after you. There's that There's that pro and that con there because the, the pro is that you can learn from someone else's experience and understand other people have gone through this. I may go through this, but if you turned it into an expectation, oh, this is the normal way to grieve. That could be a real constraint that could imprison you almost. Yeah. And, 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 and then you could, you could start to feel inadequate or you, or you could feel in a way like, am am, am I not a feeling person? Am I, am I not feeling right? Am I not, am I not doing this right and yeah. am i like dishonoring the person who's gone yeah because I'm, I'm i'm fucking up this grief thing yeah, yeah. and elizabeth kubler ross if i'm correct she was swiss and let me tell you the swiss when it comes to order and rules and decorum who oh i mean the germans are notorious but they're nothing compared to the swiss if you grieve out of order they will they will let you know oh they will i i have family in switzerland there's a, a branch of my family in switzerland and uh really yes can concur let me ask you, Jason, given your experience with this and, and experiencing the, the, the stages of grief maybe a little differently than have been laid out, 
Do you think people could have grief biohacking journals where we record our daily grief stages to kind of, you know, just have a, a, a bigger picture on how we're going through things? Oh, you mean like just like charting their progress as the, as they go every morning? Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, Lex and I are really into uh, journaling, journaling as a, as a means to understanding yourself, developing yourself, and growing. And bio-optimizing yourself, optimizing exactly. your stages. Oh, got it, got yeah. it. Yeah, quantified self, optimized self. Because it's not enough to be in a state of grief. You have to be in the best state of grief you can be. An optimal state of grief, people. Well, it's true. I mean, uh, you know, even, even now, because, you know, once once someone dies, you never like, fully emerge. Um, I, you know, I, I, I will wake up and I will look in the mirror and I will tell myself that I'm doing it wrong. Yeah. Uh, and that I'm weak. Um, and that, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not a man. I'm not doing it right. Yeah. And, um, and then maybe I'll shriek a little. Mm. Yeah. A good shriek is important. Yeah. It's probably helpful just for people, just for people to hear that, that the way everyone grieves is going to be individual. There's not, you know, setting the Swiss aside, there's not a right way or a wrong way here. And the way that you go through it, that's okay. Yeah. To quote Def Leppard, you're bringing on the heartache. Yeah. And uh, you're going through it, you know, and you, and you have to be able to do it your way. Yeah, that's true. I mean, they, uh, well, there's, there's just so much wisdom in, in Def Leppard lyrics, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's one of the major things that we recommend if you're, if you're grieving is you should listen to a lot of Def Leppard, but more importantly, read the lyrics, people. You miss out so much when you don't read the lyrics. Yeah, they're not just phenomenal musicians, okay? They're also supreme lyricists. They tell a story. They take you through a process. They will take you through a journey in your own mind, honestly. Yeah, just like Journey. Yeah, no, that, that, that's true. I mean, if you're not reading, you'll just hear like rocket. Yeah, and it'll just like go in one ear and out the other, and you won't, you know, be like, yeah, it won't sink in. You won't think about it. So exactly, Ex exactly. exactly. Okay, Jason, we want to pitch something to you. We have an idea. We want to offer it to you for your reaction. Grief strike the app available in all app stores. You track your daily grief stages, yeah. and Grief Strike the app helps you optimize and grieve better over time. Grief strike, grieve faster, grieve better. What do you think? Oh, I like that. I yeah. like that. I mean, I, I think anything that can sort of turbocharge, uh, the, you know, the grieving process. Anything yes. that, yes. Um, like a run tracker for morning, basically. You yeah. Could, you know. Yeah. I'm all in favor of it. You know, I'm, I'm sure with different settings, you can sort of, um, you can sort of measure things like your heart rate, you could measure, um, you could make up, make up some like statistics, like your sort of sadness quotient, things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love that. Yeah. I would definitely want to optimize my sadness quotient. I'm not sure in what, in which direction, but I would definitely want to optimize it. Well, Jason, we'll definitely, we have a team of, of app developers and we'll, we'll get right on that. They will be in touch. Oh, they will, they will be in touch. We'll make it happen. That's fantastic. Yeah, ab absolutely. We'll, we will make it happen. Uh, now, you you revealed in the book something that was very interesting, which is that Kubler-Ross came up with a bonus sixth stage of grief that she never revealed. It was mind-blowing. Her PR company created a viral marketing campaign in the early 2000s to launch the new grief stage, but Kubler-Ross died suddenly before she revealed the new stage, and the world never learned the sixth grief stage. It's true. So we want to ask you, we have some theories about this that we've been talking about and mulling over, but if you had to guess based on your experience, what do you think the bonus stage really was? That's a good question. Um, I mean, if if the last one is traditionally uh, acceptance, it could be yeah. like uh, re-immersion. Maybe you just start yeah. over. Ooh. Maybe um, it's actually not a progression. Maybe it's just a cycle. And maybe she couldn't bear to reveal that to yeah. the world ultimately. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's, that's actually very similar to some of the thoughts we had. So we had a thought that 
we had a couple of thoughts. One is yeah. that the next stage is iteration. Cause, cause we're huge fans of iteration of huge going fans. back and optimizing. So go back through all of the grief phases again, but do them more efficiently. Oh, that makes sense. So, so the, so the yeah. first five stages were just essentially practice. A hundred percent. Exactly. And that's, and that's a metaphor for life. Cause what is this, if not practice for the next thing for the next stage? But well, that's true. And so you, so yeah. you, so you may have to grieve for decades until you are grieving th the way you ought to be grieving. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Grief takes practice. That's why it's important to be aware of all the people in your life that are just dropping like flies. Yeah. All right. So you get, you get the most practice in. That exactly. Makes, that makes sense. Okay. If you want to know more about that, I highly recommend listening to the song Dropping Like Flies, which was a B-side bonus song on Def Leppard's Pyromania. Such such a good song. Uh, very, very emotional. And, yeah. and, and that song actually has the most lyrics of any song Def Leppard's ever made. Yeah, by far the most lyrics. Word count is high. Wow. Lex, I, I just wanted to pitch in another possibility as to what I think the final stage might have been. Yeah. I think that... Elizabeth Kubler Ross was showing us the last stage, which is death. Once you accept everything, the only thing you can do is, is die. die. Wow. Oh, because you're finally prepared. Yeah, you get yeah, it. You exactly. understand. And that just get back to the uh, the idea of it as practice. Now you're ready. Interesting. Fantastic. I do. I do have another. I do have one more idea that I want to uh, float as a hypothesis for the bonus stage, which is that the final stage is questioning. And mm. that's a phase where you reject, because remember, she said, finally, there's acceptance. But then I want to propose that there's actually a bonus phase where you reject your own acceptance and question the official death story. So you ask yourself, was it really a heart attack? Mm. Or was it in fact something more sinister that it perhaps involved the CIA and the Mossad? So you, so, oh, oh, so, oh, so you, you begin to challenge the sort of origin story of your grief, the whole they, thing. Yeah, you challenge it all. It's all on the table. You are, you are like Descartes asking whether any of this could be true, whether any of this could be false. It's all on the table to be rejected. That's interesting. Well, you know, I, I, I have been watching some YouTube videos lately. Oh, me too. I mean, about um, what really happened with my mother. It's weird that like yeah. someone made a YouTube video about that, but, um, that's what happens when you're a successful author. Everybody has their speculations. Yeah. I wonder if any of those are fans who have, you know, sort of, um, twisted ideas, or I wonder if some of those are where people that you banished in that group, those could mm. be haters. Or it could be people with the facts. That's all. It could be people yeah. who just know and need to tell the world, I think. Well, I want to be fair. Yep. Sometimes the truth is just the truth. Yeah. All right. Now we've focused on your book, Grief Strike. We do want to point out, though, that you you are a wonderful author. You've actually written twenty previous books on grief. I've read them all. They're all absolute masterpieces. We all just want to highlight to our audience a few of them here because, yes, better use. By Grief Strike. It's a wonderful book. It will not only help you grieve, it will help you laugh, which is so important. So important in life to laugh, but also get the 20 previous books. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a few of them and maybe you could share like one tip from each or give us some of the inspiration. So one of them I really loved was Saying Goodbye the Nordic Track Way. This is a book that talks about how structured daily cardio on an elliptical machine can make grieving much easier and better. Love that. And as someone who absolutely prizes physical fitness, I just loved saying goodbye to the Nordic Trackway. Do you want to share a takeaway maybe about using cardio to grieve better? Sure, I'd love to. Although, I just to correct you, um, it's not cardio in general. It's not um, a treadmill or Peloton. It's mm. just a Nordic track. It's it just, has to be a Nordic track. It has okay. to be oh. a totally uh, cross-country simulator. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know anything about cardio what effect that would have or not, but gotcha. But I do think that if you had, you know, if, if, if you have the instructions for a neuro track, a lot of the insights that you get from it, from assembling it, from using it can, it surprised me, but can, can help you as you sort of get through the grieving process. 
Um, huh. Yeah, I don't I don't have it with me right now, but I was astonished. Yeah, as I was doing like an Alpine five mile uh, on my not a real one, obviously, but um, sure. yeah. on my Simulated. nerd track, how much better I felt and how much more I understood about the yeah. grieving process. And so uh, the book has all kinds of workouts. It has an interview uh, with the current CEO of Nora Track. Uh, it's it's very short. He it was about ten seconds. He didn't want mm. to have that conversation. But a- anyway, wow, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I I think, but it has to be the Nora Track. I I if yeah. if you're doing an elliptical, I I have good luck with that. Yeah. The specificity is the most important thing. I'm really glad that you 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 clarified that for our better use. Better use, get on a Nordic track and get better. You know, I have to believe that if you get the heart pumping, you get the heart healing. And so that that really resonated with me. When you get the heart pumping with a Nordic track, look, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news here, but mm. I know a lot of a lot of our better use out there have Pelotons. Yes. Um I, I don't have anything to say, but I'm sorry. Yeah. Strike one, better use. Strike yeah. one. Yeah. Okay, next book, A Vulnerable Person's Guide to Cults and Militias. Wow, this one, what a book. Yeah. This one was an eye-opener. I learned that during the grief process, the average person, this was completely fascinating to me, so thank you for this book. The average Please, person is 54 you. times more likely to subscribe to Soldier of Fortune magazine or to join a comet worshiping <clears throat> death cult. Hmm. Now, this is due to vulnerability. Exactly. So I guess yeah, I'm wondering, do you have any tips on staying vigilant while you're grieving so that you don't end up joining a cause you end up regretting later? Well, I mean, you may want to join that cause. I'm not, I'm not, the mm. book is agnostic in terms of, um, of cult, in terms of cults, whether yeah. you ought yeah. to do it. Um, yeah. But it does, it does prepare you. It does introduce certain sort of tenets of cults. Yeah. Uh, there's a list of cults. The Heaven's Gate website is still up and running. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. Um, now they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and they crossed over, you know. Um, wow. But um, yeah, it's just, it's it's a very confusing time. And you might feel, feel yourself drawn to the sort of comfort and security and the warm embrace of a cult. Yeah. Which is fine. Which is fine. Um, yeah. But it may not be what you need long term, and so the book really lays out the options for cults, how much of your material belongings, whether it's whether your of course your very life is something you're going to have to give away. Is there some sort of guru figure you're going to have to, you know, sexually placate? You know, a lot of yeah. things. Yeah, I lay out a lot of things that you have to consider in a really, really um, challenging time. Um, and people have, have written to me, they've received permission to write to me from their, um, mm-hmm. superior, um, to tell me that, um, their, their new life, their new identity, um, is thanks to me. Yeah. Yeah. And, wow. Yeah. And they no longer think of their loved one because as far as they're concerned, they never existed. So that's incredible. I played a part in that. Yeah, it's wonderful that you were able to off that, offer that guide without judgment. What you're saying is you're saying, look, this is just a guide to these cults and militias that are probably going to try to seduce you while you're grieving. And you're not saying to join. You're not saying don't join. You're just saying here are the options. I'm, I'm just saying think about it because there, there's not one way to grieve. Yeah. I'd feel like a hypocrite if I said, okay, well, don't move into the mountains with this shaman who said he's the original Jesus Christ. Hmm. Why would I do that? Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And and as we tell our better yous, better yous, all of you, our followers, it is important that you find a path to your greatness, a path to your enlightenment. And, you know, we don't want you to mindlessly follow anybody, better yous, but yeah. that's why we're here for you. We want to set you on the right path we're not swindlers. We're not trying to trick you. Subscribe to the podcast. Stay subscribed. That's what we say. Yeah, we we like to be guides because we we always say you should never be mind mindless. You should always have your critical thinking caps on. And we we do sell critical thinking caps at our on our web store, by the way. But 
Yeah. That aside. Real quick, just just want to say, because yeah. we'll put yeah. it aside, but those thinking yeah. caps, they're responsible for some of the greatest inventions and advancements of the last 10 years. So yeah. I don't want to undersell it. Yeah, we actually invented our anti-materialist products while we were using our thinking caps. Of course. Wow. Side note. But yeah, we the whole point is that we, on this on this podcast, Seth and I, we do the critical thinking so that you don't have to. Fantastic. Yeah. I wanted to ask about one more book because this this is the one that really spoke to me. Good. Why is this happening, Gaston? The Complete Directory of Costume Disney Mascots Secretly Authorized to Talk to You About Death. Right. Now, this one was an eye-opener. It was huge. There, there are obvious ones like Mufasa from The Lion King, but even less obvious ones like Sebastian, the Jamaican crab from The Little Mermaid, is helping us grieve one of Disney's unsung contributions. Yeah, it's, it's, it's strange that, well, it, I was surprised in my research to discover that any of the mascots were doing this to any of the uh, park visitors at all. Why would this be happening? I don't know, but it, w- it was interesting to find mm. out. And then to discover that it was kind of like a speakeasy. You never knew who 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 had the training right. to help you work through grief. And so you could approach, let's say, Chippendale. Yeah. And you could... Rescue Rangers. Yeah, yeah. right. And you, and you could say to Chip, listen, I'm really, I'm really going through... Sus- some stuff after my father died and mm. he would just kind of smile and do a dance because it's just an actor in a costume. Yeah. You go to Dale and you know, Dale would say, well, I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss. Let's talk about it. Wow. Oh, he was always the more thoughtful one. Yeah. You know, like, there, there, yeah. you just never know yes. who is going to be happy to sit there and just let you talk without judgment. You know, it could be Snow White could just kind of wave and walk away because she doesn't yeah. want to have that conversation. But right. Cinderella can just let you talk and hold your hand and yeah. just and tell you that she's so sorry. You know, you don't know. Yeah. I don't know why it's such a surprise, but that's Disney does things their own way, I guess. It makes sense. I mean the price of a Disney ticket is, you know, a little exorbitant for people with not very much money. But the cost of great therapy is baked into that. You get what you pay for, and you paid for more than you think that you're getting. And it's it's really amazing to go there. I I actually had a very, uh, a very very deep conversation with Buzz from Toy Story, mm. and uh, you know, he really took my my grief. He helped me overcome it, and I have been able to go to infinity and beyond ever since. Lovely. Well, that 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 that's a uh, fantastic. Yeah, I uh, I recall one visit. I talked to Captain Hook, oh. and um, I explained my situation, and he said, "Well, unfortunately, um, you know, we don't take your insurance." And I mm. said, "Well, how much is it going to cost?" And he said, "That's going to be two hundred an hour." And I said, "Is there a sliding scale?" And he said, "Well, there is in some cases if you can bring in proof of income." Yeah. Um, so it was a long conversation. I, I assumed it would be free because uh, I already paid mm. for the park. But of course, yeah. Well, that's the thing about Cap- Captain Hook. That's what makes him a villain because he really is. He really is kind of an asshole about those things. I find pirates in general are not good on sliding scales. Yeah, I fa- I found that time and time again in my life, and that's one of the things that really pisses me off about pirates. I will say flexibility. I will say Shmi, if you find Shmi in the park, he's he's hiding. He will give you free advice, but he will only give it to you in the under the cover of darkness. You have to go to another corner because he's I mean, he's doing it outside of the rules. And I like a guy who plays outside the rules a little bit. We both we both do. That's what we do on this podcast. Jason Thank you so much. Your your book is wonderful. We thoroughly enjoyed it. We recommend that all of our listeners buy Grief Strike and buy a copy for all of those uh, who might be grieving or who might grieve in the future. Now, you do say that. You do say that um, because it is a very funny book. You say that that may not be right for everyone, and you're, you're, you're fine with that. You wrote it being okay with the fact that this book may not be for every griever, but for some of them, it could really hit the sweet spot. So thoughtful. I think so. Yeah. I think it, it, I think it 
works for most people at a certain point in their process. Maybe not right away, maybe a few weeks or months or years. But yeah, there may be some people who will never want to encounter their grief with a book like mine, which is fine, I guess. Yeah, if you don't if you don't want to grow, if you don't want to improve. Jason, I just realized something. Something just dawned on me. I think Elizabeth Kubler Ross saw the future. And you know what I think the sixth phase is? Read Grief Strike. Amazing. Wow. She knew it was coming, but the time wasn't there. That's why she couldn't reveal it because it hadn't happened yet. Wow. That's well that well, that's fantastic. I mean, I'm I'm a little resentful she didn't reveal this in life, but fine, I'll take it. Yeah. You heard it here first, better use the final step to grief and overcoming grief is reading grief strike. If you're not doing that, you might as well just cry your eyes out for the rest of your life. And you may just be repeating your grief over and over again. Yeah, just something to leave you with. Jason, do you have any message here that you would want to give our better use? Any final tips or thoughts on grief and how to approach it? Any last words? It's all in the book. Um, yeah. I mean, it's all in the book. I mean, there's nothing yeah. I can say that wouldn't just be redundant or ridiculous. It's all perfectly articulated in the book. That's brilliant. Yeah. That is, that is completely fair. Check out the book. Uh, where can our better use find you online? What's the best place to follow you, find your books, find all of your wonderful written and humorous work? Well, you could um, visit my website, uh, jasonroder.info. Info Info is the elite. Um, not yeah. many people can score an info. No. Well, that's how you know it's good information. That's how you know when people wonder what it is. Well, I spell it out for them. So... Yeah. To start, Jason Roder, Jason Roder info. I'm on Twitter at at Jason Roder. That's R O E G E R. Yeah, that's it. Those two things. Great. That's you amazing. Know, one of the reasons that info is is so elusive is because before Walt Disney died and had his body cryogenically frozen so that mm -hmm. he could be resurrected later, he instructed his cronies to buy many of the dot info. Yeah domains that was one of his actual last acts oh, i had no idea just a just a little side fact there so that's just another example of you overcoming something beating the odds and and just becoming the best version of yourself you can be a rotor reader today if you go to jasonrotor.info i definitely recommend it jason thank you so much for this conversation we thoroughly enjoyed it thank you guys thank you so much for having me you but better. Friends, thank you for listening and becoming a better you. And if you haven't followed us on social media yet, you haven't fully committed. Find those social links in the episode description. Also, please rate and review us on your podcast listening app. It helps more people find this podcast and become totally enlightened. And remember, don't just be you, be you but better.